So this one minute plus is about the three main types of fault. How you might recognize them when you're out in the mountains, what causes them and also their tectonic context. But before we get on to those three main types of fault, we have to do a little bit of background. So first of all, about the way that we describe planes in geology. So here's a plane. It's got a horizontal direction. This is called the strike. So this is a plane which is at an angle. It's not vertical, it's an at an angle from um, the vertical. And we have a horizontal direction, which we call the strike direction. And then we have a dip direction, which is at right angles. This is the steepest direction within this plane. And that's defined by the angle, actually the angle from the horizontal. Uh, so a vertical plane has a dip of 90 degrees. And then there's the direction of dip as well. So we have the strike, the angle of dip, and the direction of dip. So now we can start to think about the way that stresses act on planes. So stresses. Any arbitrary stress can be divided into principal stress directions. So sigma one is the maximum compressive stress in geology. Sigma three is the minimum compressive stress, which is by definition is at right angles. And then sigma two is the intermediate compressive stress at right angles to that sigma one, sigma three plane, okay? So I'm gonna be talking about sigma one and sigma three in particular, because that's what drives faulting the orientation and differences between sigma one and sigma three. So if we consider the sigma one, sigma three plane, then if you over compress a rock, if you make this difference big enough, the rock will br brittly fail in the upper crust and you get a fault, okay? The angle of the fault to sigma one will typically be about 30 degrees. That's actually, that angle is constrained, is defined by the friction of the rock. So I've drawn this plane on consistent with this sigma one, sigma three direction. But of course there's another plane that has exactly the same angle, and this is called the conjugate plane. So you can end up with conjugate fault sets. Sometimes you only get one developed and sometimes you see both developed. So now with those simple bits of background, we can go on to talk about the different types of fault that you see. First of all, normal faults. And these were the ones which are first identified. They're often the easiest to see because the displacements are largely vertical. And if you have any horizontal layers such as beds, or this is a sill here, then you end up with very clear displacements. So normal faults are the ones that you will be most easily identify in the field. Okay. And they're produced by stretching. So if we have sigma three in the horizontal plane, that's the minimum compressive stress, or in this case, a stretching stress. Sigma one is then gravity. And what happens is that the rock breaks and you end up with essentially a valley, what's called a graben. And then these highlands are called horse. So we have a horse graben system and the, there's been a general extension. Okay, this is how you make normal faults. You can't go very far with normal faults. You can't extend very far with normal faults because the crust is only a few tens of kilometers thick. So if you extend too far, then you end up exposing the mantle, which melts and produces ocean crust. So this is actually how you go from a rifting system into ocean crust production, okay? And because sigma one is vertical, these are very steep faults. They're typically around 60 degrees or so the angle on these, the dip on these faults. And the motion is down dip rather than a long strike. And the iconic uh, normal faults in Scotland are the Highland Boundary Fault and the Southern Uplands Fault with the Midland Valley in between forming this uh, graben. The opposite of that are called thrust faults or reverse faults. This is for compression rather than tension in the crust and you end up producing very low angle faults. This is actually part of the Moyne thrust here. So here we're compressing horizontally. Sigma three, the least compressive stress is vertical. So you end up with a low angle fault, which stacks up rocks like this. So this is a thrust fault and it happens in convergent settings. So where you've got plate tectonic convergence, for example, in subduction zones. So the main fault on a, 
subduction zone is actually called a mega thrust fault, <laughs> this fault up here. Once the ocean closes fully and you get continent constant collision, then you get a thrust between the overriding continental plate and the downgoing continental plate. And that examples of that will be the Moyne thrust or the Outer Hebrides thrust. And the other time you, that you get thrusting in these convergent settings is in this region here, what's called the accretionary prism. So if you have large enough ocean basins, then you end up with a layer of sediment on the top of the ocean floor. And as that goes down, as the ocean plate subducts, that sediment gets scraped off in a series of thrust faults. And you get these little slices of um, ocean floor sediment stacked up on top of each other, repeating in age each of these thrust faults uh, brings older material on top of younger, so you get this repetition of age in it. And this is actually what the Southern Uplands is. And the Southern Uplands was where thrusting was first identified. So the Moyne thrust and the Outer Hebrides thrusts are examples of major continental scale, plate tectonic scale thrust faults where oceans have closed and different continents have risen over each other. And finally, strike slip faults. So the Great Glen is the obvious strike slip fault in Scotland. In this case, we have sigma 1 and sigma 3 in the horizontal plane, and sigma 2 is now gravity. So if you compress the rock like this, what's going to happen is you're going to get a fault like this. So the fault will be pretty much vertical, and the orientation of the fault is controlled by this horizontal sigma 1 direction. And the Great Glen Fault is a good example of that. So they're the three main types of fault. We have normal faults, the Highland Boundary Fault and the Southern Upland Faults. We have thrust faults, the Moyne and the Outer Hebrides Thrust. And then we have transform faults or strike slip faults, which is the Great Glen Fault. So how do you tell what sort you have? This is another picture of the Moyne Thrust. You can see that it's actually dipping at a very low angle. So that's often a good indicator for thrust faults. In here, it's very obviously a thrust fault because these red rocks on top are Louisian age gneisses. So they're about three billion years old. Underneath this gray rock is um, Cambrian quartzite, so about 540 million years old. So older rock has been thrust on top of younger rock. So that definitely says that this is a thrust fault. However, often it's not so obvious. So here's a less obvious fault. So we can see a line across here, and we can see a bed that comes up to that line, and then another bed that comes up to the line here. So that's the fault, and this is a single displaced bed. So if we consider this, ignore everything else, and just consider those displaced beds. It's something like this. We have the fault, we have this displaced bed. In three dimensions, it might look something like this. So now we have the fault plane, which is going down into the earth, and these beds are dipping at some angle here. So the question is, how do we get this purple bed displaced across to the blue bed? And there are two end members of how you can do it. You can go vertically, so that would be a normal fault, or you can go horizontally, so that would be a strike slip fault, and there could be anything in between. So if you have these kinds of bedding displacement markers, then they don't provide a new unique solution for the displacement. Okay, there are several ways that you can get there. They tell you the amount of displacement, but they don't tell you the direction, unless you have things which are not parallel. If you had a dike cutting here, which was also cut by that, then you might get a unique solution. So you also need something which indicates the direction of motion and that's called a kinematic indicator. So here is a really nice kinematic indicator. This is a fault plane, and these lines on here are called fault plane lineations, or silicon sides, and in this case, they're actually little quartz crystals which are growing on the fault plane. They grew as the fault was active. So one half of this fault is missing, so here's the block with the fault plane in it. This is the strike direction, the horizontal direction, and you can see in this case that all of these little quartz crystals, these fibers, are parallel to dip. So the motion is 
in the steepest direction on that fault plane. So it's essentially vertical motion on the fault plane. Okay. And in this case, you can see that all the fibers terminate at their bottom. Okay. So that means that the, the block which is missing has moved downwards. So the sense of motion is like this. Okay. So that says it's a normal fault. So these are very clear indicators in this case that it's a normal fault. And if you were to rub your finger along it, you rub your finger downwards, it would feel smooth. Whereas if you rubbed your finger upwards, it, it would feel very rough. <laughs> and you might end up with some little quartz fibers stuck in your finger as well. So if you see slick inside, when you rub your finger on them along the direction of the fibers, um, if it feels smooth, then you're moving in the direction of the missing block. So you're moving in the same sense of motion as the fault plane. So these are really good kinematic or direction indicators. This is an example, another example. And this, these are gypsum fibers growing actually in an active fault in southern Spain. And in this case, the motion is the sense of motion is oblique. So it's got a, a, a component of dip slip and a component of strike slip in it. And that's relatively rare. You, these kind of mixed um, composite faults are relatively rare. So to summarize, all you need to know is you need to know the orientation of the fault plane. Normal faults, normally the dip is 60 degrees or so, so relatively steep. Thrust faults, the dip is 30 degrees or parallel to bedding often, so very low angle. But in both these cases, the motion is either down dip or up dip. Okay, so there's no strike slip component normally in normal faults and thrust faults. Okay, and strike slip faults themselves, the fault plane is nearly vertical, very close to vertical, but the motion is horizontal on them. Okay, so the displacement of geological units, if you've got beds or dikes which are cut, they give you the amount of displacement if we know the direction. And you get the direction from kinematic indicators, such as fault plane lineations and slick and side, and there are some other ones as well. But essentially they give the direction, but they don't give the amount of slip. So by combining all three of these things, you can uh, constrain what happens with the fault. Now, the only other thing to say is that once you have a fault, you have a weakness in the rock, and often they get reactivated and they can be in the same direction, but they can also end up changing direction as well. But in general, if you have these three parts, you can work out what the motion is on the fault plane.